February 12th, 2009, Washington, D.C. 46-year-old Pamela Butler arrives at her house, which is monitored by surveillance cameras. After not hearing from her for five days, Pam's family visits her home and discovers that she has vanished without explanation. Confusingly, even though the surveillance cameras show Pam entering her house, no footage exists of her leaving. However, Pam's boyfriend is shown entering and exiting the home multiple times, yet there is no evidence to indicate what actually happened to her. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone and welcome to The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host Robin Mortar, and for our first mini-sode of 2017, I've selected a pretty strange mystery. The 2009 disappearance of Pamela Butler, which is a unique variation of a locked room mystery. A locked room mystery is when someone is murdered under seemingly impossible circumstances, such as when a body is discovered in a room which was locked from the inside. Well this particular case could almost be described as a locked room disappearance, as a woman somehow vanished without a trace inside her locked home even though the house was monitored by surveillance cameras, and none of the existing footage shows her leaving. I previously featured this case in an article I wrote for listverse.com titled 10 Unsolved Mysteries with Creepy Surveillance Footage, which was originally published in August of 2015. I also got a refresher on this case when I saw it at the official Unsolved Mysteries website. Even though this story was never featured on Unsolved Mysteries, the site allows people to submit their own personal mysteries which can subsequently be turned into YouTube videos. Pamela Butler's brother Derek recorded a webcam video in which he made a public plea for information and it was posted on the website. Derek has often stated that he doesn't think his sister's case has gotten the proper media attention it deserves because she is black, so I'm quite happy to give her story some exposure on this podcast. But before we get started, just a quick reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast which alternates between our regular full-length episodes and 15-20 to minute minisodes like this one. We deliver either a new episode or a new minisode every Wednesday. We're currently available for download on several platforms, including iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music, so if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it. The Trail Went Cold also has its own PayPal account and a donate button on the website. If there's anyone out there who's feeling generous and wants to make a donation, we would greatly appreciate it, and we'll be sure to give you a shout-out on a future episode. We actually received a new donation this week from a listener who goes by the handle mtgmaster12345, so thank you, mtgmaster12345. And I've also got a special announcement to make. The Trail Went Cold's Facebook page has recently attained 1,000 likes, and to commemorate this milestone, we decided to put up a poll on the page and let you, our wonderful listeners, vote for a case to cover on a future episode. I selected one of the most popular articles I published at listverse.com, 10 Entertainment Careers Cut Short by Unsolved Mysteries, and I'm giving you all the opportunity to vote for one of the 10 cases featured on that list. I haven't featured any of these cases on the podcast yet, and they're all pretty interesting so I'm quite happy to do a full-fledged analysis on whichever mystery wins the popular vote. And since our podcast's one-year anniversary is coming up in mid-February, the winning case will be featured on our anniversary episode. Because really, our fan base has made this such an awesome first year for us, so what better way to thank all of you than by letting you select the case which will commemorate this occasion. The poll closes next Tuesday, January the 17th at midnight, so if you haven't voted already, be sure to visit the poll on our Facebook page before next Tuesday and let your vote be heard. So with all that out of the way, let us now profile the mysterious disappearance of Pamela Butler. Our story begins in 2009 in Washington, D.C. Our central figure is Pamela Butler, a 47-year-old African-American woman who works as a computer systems analyst with the Environmental Protection Agency. She has been divorced once, but has recently started dating a 44-year-old man named Jose Rodriguez Cruz. The couple met on an internet dating website and have been together five months at this point. On February 12th, Pam phoned her mother, Thelma Butler, and let her know that both she and her boyfriend were going to take her out to dinner on Valentine's Day. But unfortunately, this would be the last time Thelma ever spoke with her daughter. Pam and Jose were supposed to pick up Thelma at 3pm on Valentine's Day, but they never arrived. Even after making numerous attempts to contact her daughter, Thelma never heard back from her, which was very unusual, as they practically spoke on a daily basis. After not hearing from Pam for three days, Thelma and some relatives, including her son Derek, went to check her house, which was located in the Brightwood neighborhood. It should be noted that Pam was a woman who was very protective of her personal safety. After an arsonist started a series of fires in the area in which Pam lived, she decided to install a high-tech security system at her home, which included an alarm, motion-activated floodlights, and surveillance cameras. Anyway, when Pam's family arrived there, the front door was locked, but Pam's nephew had a spare key to let them inside. It turned out that Pam was not there, but they were all surprised to discover that the alarm system was turned off, as she never forgot to set it whenever she left the house. A note, presumably written by her boyfriend, was found on a table, and it read, Pam, where are you? Are we still taking your mother to dinner? 
There were a number of things inside the home which caused concern. Pam was known for being very orderly and meticulous about keeping her house neat and tidy, and if you went there, you would never see anything out of place. Yet that wasn't the case here. Some files were scattered on the floor inside her office. A blue latex glove was also found on the floor for some reason. All of the sheets from Pam's bed were inexplicably missing, and the bed's pillows and comforter were resting on top of a love seat. Pam's family was also surprised to see that the blind was halfway open on one of the windows in the dining room. Like I said earlier, Pam was very protective of her privacy, and did not like people looking in on her, so it was very unusual for one of her blinds to be open. And this particular window also happened to be unlocked. Pam's purse, containing her driver's license and credit cards, and the keys to the house, were nowhere to be found. The keys to both the vehicles she owned had also disappeared, but they were both still parked there. So Pam's family finally decided to report her missing. When police searched the house, they found no signs of forced entry or foul play. But unlike most missing persons cases, investigators had 24-hour surveillance footage of the victim's home, and the feed from the security cameras was available for viewing on Pam's computer. Yet when they looked at the footage, it only caused more confusion. So the footage showed Pam and her boyfriend, Jose Rodriguez Cruz, leaving the house on the morning of February 12th after spending the night together. That evening, Jose arrived back at the house and waited by the front door until Pam returned home and they went inside together. At 9.48 p.m., Pam could be seen leaning outside the front door to grab her mail, but this would be the last time she would ever show up on the surveillance video. Amazingly, no footage actually existed of her leaving the house, so how did she manage to just disappear? Well, it turned out that Jose would turn up on the footage a lot. He was next seen leaving the house on the morning of February 13th, before returning at 8 p.m. Jose then left again at 11.30, but over the course of the next few days, he would be seen entering and exiting the house on three different occasions. On Valentine's Day, he would be there for two hours. On February 15th, he visited the house for a half hour. And on the 16th, he's there for 90 minutes. On each of these occasions, Jose can be seen carrying a bag as he leaves. The first two times it's a duffel bag, and the last time it's a trash bag. Other than brief visits from a mailman and a UPS delivery man, neither of whom entered the house, Jose is the only person who pops up on the surveillance footage during this time period when Pam went missing. Well, the police questioned Jose, and he claimed that when he visited Pam's house on the evening of February 13th, she suddenly decided to break up with him for reasons he didn't understand. Nevertheless, Jose said there was no ill will in the breakup, and the reason he came back to the house on three separate occasions was to pick up his personal belongings which were there, which would explain why he's carrying bags in the surveillance footage. However, he claimed that the last time he saw Pam was when he left the house on the 13th, and he didn't see her at all during his three return visits. Jose claimed he attempted to phone Pam on multiple occasions to ask if he could come over to pick up his stuff, but he could never get a hold of her, and she did not respond to his voicemails. So he just decided to show up and let himself in with a spare set of keys Pam had given him. He left that note regarding the Valentine's Day dinner with Pam's mother, and just assumed that Pam was deliberately avoiding him. Now, Jose was a former military police officer who had a history of post-traumatic stress disorder. He also had a police record for domestic violence and some stab wounds on his back from an incident with an ex-girlfriend, but he was never actually charged with any crime or served any time in jail. Initially, Jose was cooperative with the investigation, as he allowed police to search his home and impound his car to look for evidence. At one point, Derek Butler convinced Jose to take a polygraph exam. However, while Derek was driving Jose to the exam, Jose suddenly leaped out of the car while they were stopped at an intersection and ran away. Jose soon returned and claimed he really had to go to the bathroom and just couldn't hold it. When they arrived at the police station, Jose suddenly changed his mind about the polygraph and walked out of the room while screaming obscenities. Jose claimed his PTSD had caused him to freak out. He decided the police had developed tunnel vision and were railroading him, so ever since then he has refused to speak with them or cooperate in the investigation. Unfortunately, the investigation seems to have hit a standstill. Pam's disappearance was given an extensive article in the Washington Post and recently featured on the TV show Crime Watch Daily, but it hasn't gotten a whole lot of exposure, and Pam's family feel this is because of her race. At one point, they explored the possibility that Pam disappeared voluntarily by sending her a fake text message that her mother was in the hospital. But she never responded, and there has been no trace of her in nearly eight years. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. So, I guess you're wondering, how could a woman just vanish from her home surrounded by surveillance cameras and not show up on any of the footage? Well, even though the cameras covered all the exits, it did not cover the left side of the house, so there were a few blind spots. Three of the house's windows were not visible in the surveillance footage, two of which were located in the dining room. Now, you heard me refer to this as a locked room disappearance, but that isn't 100% accurate, since one of the dining room windows was found unlocked. And this window's blind was also halfway open, which was very uncharacteristic for Pam. So it seems like the only logical explanations are that Pam could have climbed out of that window and taken off, or someone else killed her and used the window to smuggle her body out of the house. And of course, it doesn't seem like there could be any other suspect but Jose Rodriguez Cruz. It's weird how the surveillance footage almost seems to incriminate and exonerate him at the same time. It shows no one else entering or exiting the house during the time period Pam went missing. Yet there isn't anything incriminating in the footage to prove Jose committed murder. And there's also the question of motive. 
Pam and Jose had only been together five months, but according to everyone who knew them, there didn't seem to be any real friction in the relationship, and they appeared to be happy together. Jose claimed that Pam suddenly broke up with him without warning, but given that he had PTSD and at least one incident of domestic violence on his record, it's possible this could have caused him to snap and kill her. It might not have been premeditated murder, but a crime of passion, as Jose might have struck Pam and caused her to accidentally fall over and hit her head or something. If this is what happened, it most likely occurred sometime after Jose returned to the house at 8pm on February 13th. Even though Pam had not shown up on the surveillance video since the previous evening, this wouldn't have been unusual for her. February 13th was a Friday, and Pam always worked from home on Fridays, and she sent at least two emails from her computer that day. So at the very least, Pam was alive the entire day before Jose got home. You're probably thinking this is a mystery with a very obvious solution, but here's the intangible question. If Jose killed Pam, how did he manage to get her body out of the house? Well, I'm sure horrific thoughts have already popped into your heads when I mentioned that Jose was seen carrying either a duffel bag or a trash bag each time the footage showed him exiting the house. Did Jose dismember Pam's body and smuggle her out of the house in pieces? That might sound like a logical theory on the surface, but I doubt that actually happened. Evidence technicians took over Pam's house for three straight months and examined every square inch of it, and they found no trace of blood or any evidence at all that a homicide had occurred. I really think that if Jose had chopped up Pam's body in there, they would have found something. The guy's not Dexter. I don't think he could have cleaned up such a gruesome murder scene that thoroughly without leaving anything behind. The biggest point in Jose's favor is that no one has ever uncovered any physical evidence to incriminate him. I mentioned earlier that Jose's car was impounded, but they also didn't find any evidence to suggest a dead body had been in there. The biggest evidence of a crime taking place is the fact that Pam's bedsheets were missing, so the most logical explanation is that Jose or someone else could have wrapped Pam's body in the sheets and smuggled her out through that one unlocked dining room window which was not covered by the surveillance camera. I've seen the location of the house, and there's a street several feet away from the window, so someone could have moved the body from the house and put it inside a parked vehicle since the entire section was not covered by the surveillance cameras. That being said, it's still an incredibly risky thing to do. Pam's house is located in a residential neighborhood, and there are houses across the street from the dining room window. Even if Pam's body was wrapped in bedsheets, a neighbor still might find it suspicious if they happen to see it being smuggled out through a window. We know that Jose was at the house between 8 and 11.30 p.m. on February 13th, but one crucial piece of information which has never been released are the exact times Jose visited the house on the 14th, 15th, and 16th. I don't think he would have tried to smuggle the body through the window in broad daylight, but if one of those visits happened to take place at, say, 2 a.m., then that's a major red flag. If this is how Pam's body was removed from the house, then it's very unlikely she was victimized by an intruder. A random perpetrator is probably not going to know the security camera's blind spots and how to successfully enter the house and exit with Pam's body without being picked up on the surveillance footage. But Jose might have known how to access the surveillance feed on Pam's computer and figure out the appropriate blind spots. In fact, one of the main reasons Jose might have re-entered the house on three separate occasions is because he needed time to formulate the perfect plan to smuggle Pam's body out of there without being caught. And there are a lot of other things which look troubling for Jose. Given how protective she was about her privacy, Pam's family have always had a hard time believing that she'd give a spare set of keys to a boyfriend she'd only known five months. And it seems especially unbelievable that Pam wouldn't have taken the spare keys back from Jose after they broke up. Since Pam's own set of keys were never found, it's suspected that Jose was using them to enter the house. When investigators asked Jose to produce this spare set of keys, he claimed he lost them. Another weird thing from the surveillance footage is when Jose arrived at the house on February 12th and just waited outside until Pam came home. Given that this was a cold February night, why wouldn't have Jose just used those spare keys to go inside himself? Jose also claimed that Pam never gave him the code for the house's alarm system, which was conveniently turned off each time he went there. Once again, it seemed out of character for Pam to have left the house on her own without turning on the alarm. And it seemed very strange that Jose left that note on the table where he asked about taking Pam's mother out for dinner. If they had broken up the night before, why would Jose still think he was going to accompany Pam when they took Thelma out on Valentine's Day? In fact, during one of his statements to police, Jose claimed that when he visited the house on Valentine's Day to retrieve his belongings, he assumed Pam was absent because she was having dinner with her mother. So why bother leaving the note in the first place? So aside from the very slim chance that Pam climbed out the dining room window and took off on her own, there is really no other logical explanation for Pam's disappearance than Jose being responsible. I believe he did kill Pam, and managed to sneak her body through the dining room window and into a vehicle without being seen by witnesses or the security cameras before he subsequently disposed of her. All that being said, Jose seemed to do a very successful job at covering his tracks, and thus far, he has essentially pulled off the perfect crime. In spite of the unbelievable aspects of his story, there is no hard evidence to implicate Jose, and there's no way you could charge him with anything unless more evidence surfaced. But I'd love it if one of our listeners out there could help change that. So if you have any information about what happened to Pamela Butler, please contact the appropriate authorities. You can phone the Metropolitan Police Department at 202-727-9099. That's 202-727-9099. But if you just have your own theory about what happened, feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email at robin.warder at icloud.com.
That's robin.warder at icloud.com. I want to thank all my loyal listeners and supporters out there, especially those from the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online Forum and the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. I need to provide a big thank you to Miguel Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. If you haven't already, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play Music. And like I mentioned earlier, we also have a donate button on our website, so if you're feeling generous and want to express your appreciation for all the hard work we put into this podcast, we'd be extremely grateful. So have yourself a good week, and join me next Wednesday for a brand new episode of The Trail Went Cold.